All right, we are coming back after a weekend looking at our proving ground. I'm going to open that up, the one I saved in Photoshop last class. And at the end of class, I had managed to place my creature. I placed them and I kind of sunk them through the layers. Oh, I see. That's the overlay. Yep. And then I showed you how to do a non-destructive overlay layer, but I'm going to review that again. Okay. So the first thing you need, of course, for your proving ground, and something uh, I've worked with some of you since last class on, is getting a finished assignment to this PNG, which is cleanly cut out and dodged and burned and just kind of flatly makes sense to you in its colors and its textures and its edges in its lighting that's what you need in order to bring it into your landscape so i'm now done with assignment two. Oh, i remember it couldn't change the color on that for some reason but since i'm done with that now i opened up assignment one i brought my creature into it as a smart object this is my smart object. And then, of course, I can use Command T on that smart object to place it, to shrink it, to flip it, to figure out different ways of integrating it into the space. And once you're happy with that, you hit Return. You keep it as a smart object. And then you make a duplicate of it. So Command J. So that you have something that's placed that then you get to erase, modify, etc. So I know I was a little rushed. I see where that hand is. I want that hand to be in it. I'm just going to move it back to about there. Right at the edge. All right. Maybe shift it up a tiny bit. Did that before? It's still a smart object. I'm just figuring out the placement. Now, the great thing about using the smart object that you brought in of your PNG and using Command T is that it will always render the pixels in the best possible way. So if I really shrunk it, if I really enlarged it, it's going to that external file and matching that pixel resolution. That's the beauty of smart objects. The problem with them is I can't dodge and burn it if it's a smart object. I can't change the pixels in it. I can only arrange them differently. I can stretch them. I can rotate them. But after that, you're going to make a duplicate and then turn off your smart object. And then we're going to rasterize the layer so it's no longer a smart object. Okay, the next step. I've got it kind of sunk into my landscape, but I might need to cut my landscape or rearrange its elements and do some internal compositing possibly so that my creature makes sense in it. Right now, my creature is coming between these two waffles, which I thought would be interesting, but without my creature, these waffles were made to kind of be seamed together you know, foreground, middle ground. So it doesn't make sense for this waffle to have this cream in front of it. So what I do is I'm going to use my, my auto select layer. I'm going to look for this layer that's overlapping my creature. And I'm actually going to lasso what I think is the edge that I want my creature to fall behind. So it's going to be this little raspberry. Again, it can be a rough cut. I have an eight pixel feather, which I just noticed, which is a little too much. And so what I'm going to do is actually hit Command J. And what I just duplicated was the thing that's overlapping. So that then 
I can select, this is being really, really cautious, and I don't think I'll need this, but then I can select around this image with that, with that feather. Turn that off and then delete that from, oh, from the other layer. So to do that, I then say select the inverse and delete. And I can use my arrow keys and kind of nest it in. I can use select and mask if I want to soften it slightly, though this is the foreground, I don't need it too soft. So I'm going to feather it maybe one and a half pixels and then delete. Now, I think I might also want my creature's arm to come up and around some of this. And I think I might want these raspberries, this is just all different depending on your landscape, to be on the ground and to kind of transition the creature onto the ground. So what am I going to do? I'm going to select this layer. I'm going to do the same thing. This is internal compositing. I'm going to lasso around the things I think might be useful, which is right here. I have an eight pixel feather. I don't necessarily need that, but it's helpful. Command J, duplicate it onto its own layer. Then I'm going to move it where I think at least that raspberry is going to be helpful. Right there. I can then sync that behind my creature. Oh, I want it on top of my creature. But I'm going to have the creature's arm on top of it. So now I can go to my rasterized creature. It's all just understanding your layers. Select around it. Get a little bit of overlap. Again, I have a bit of a feather. I can hold down uh, spacebar while I'm using my lasso to make sure I get everything on the screen just to move my selection up. Okay, and then I'm gonna Command J, duplicate that. So remember, Command J makes a perfect duplicate on top of, where, of whatever layer you're on. So now I can move that arm layer up on top and then let's turn the waffles back on and I can move the arm layer on top of that. And then I can move this on top of that. So you see I'm kind of using what's called relative perspective. Like what's in front of what <laughs> to show the depth. And sometimes you have to massage that a little bit. Now here's what's great about having this arm. I can pose it because my creature doesn't need to keep the same pose. So just with the arm, I can use it kind of like a grommet doll before I cut it out better. And I can warp it, I can transform it. We're used to that. We're gonna learn this new trick, which is called Edit Puppet Warp. Now what Puppet Warp does is it does a warp that's almost like a 3D model. It fills it with these triangular polygons. And then you have to set your anchor points. For something like an arm, the anchor point's going to be at the shoulder. This is why understanding the anatomy of your character is important. The anchor points are going to be any kind of fixed points that you want to move from. So the other will be the elbow. And then the space between these two points can be warped and changed. So if I want to change the foreshortening of that shoulder, I can't. And then I can also make one of those points the wrist. And then I can even just do the, the palm. If I do the fingers, then the fingers will get a little wonky on their own. They'll become like macaroni, which I can do in little bits. So you see, you have to plot the anchors and then pull from the anchors. So I think I want my hand to be on top of this raspberry and the elbow to kind of be covering up this raspberry behind. And that's maybe gonna look better than what I had before. So I can also use Puppet Warp on my full character, my rasterized character. You go to Edit, 
puppet warp. And then you want to find your anchor points. So the hands, the elbows, the top of the head, especially where the cranium meets the spine, the back ridge, and then you'll just, you'll see the kind of control you have of this creature's pose. If I want to open that mouth up a little bit more, I can put one at the jaw and at the top of the head. Right. Kind of tilt the head. Now, you can see how those anchor points work. So you really want to understand what you're doing and you don't want to overdo it. But it can help help match the angle of your creature to its environment. You can make it look like your creature is breathing. This is going to help later when we animate. And I can kind of sync the, uh, the little slug-like things and wrap them around this surface a little bit better if I want to. So I made quite a few differences there, and I can see that in my history. If I just go before Puppet Warp, it looked like that. And after Puppet Warp, it looks like this. Which is a little goofier. I like that the mouth's a little bigger. And I like that it showcases the, the teeth and the tusks a little bit more. But you can always do that on a duplicate as well, if you want to try it out in different ways. So that's Puppet Warp. And now since I've moved that hand, I'm thinking, okay, now I want this internally composited new aspect to be a little bit bigger. And if it's a little bit bigger like that, then I want to start blending it in. And I'm going to use my large eraser at 100%. I'm going to use my tablet. So it's pressure sensitive, a pressure sensitive brush. Nice and large. And start eating away on it, at it so that it reveals the kind of raspberry syrup. that I want this resting in. And then I might, because I have this separate arm, I might need to erase from my creature. Right here. This, this arm I don't need anymore. And again, I have my smart object. In case I ever do too much, I can always go back to my smart object layer and get it back. But that way can have the arm there and I can erase and not have, you know, it reveal another part of my creature underneath it. And when it is, I can just go back to my creature and erase that away a little bit too. Okay, now the next step, once you get things placed, is lighting. So the first thing, the most kind of first important thing to do is the angle of your creature in your environment. That's one of the tests of the proving ground. Can you understand the perspective and the angle of your landscape and your creature well enough to make it fit within it? And then secondly, can you organize everything so that it makes sense within it? Uh, 
and I'm going to have to pick, let's see, 